Welcome to API Conversations. I'm Marsha Barnhart, Chief of Investigations for the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team and your host for today's program. For this episode, we're going to travel back in time 20 years to the spring of 1997. To set the time frame, in early 1997, Bill Clinton was entering his second tour of duty as President of the United States. And every time you turned on the radio, you probably heard Elton John singing Candle in the Wind or Tony Braxton's Unbreak My Heart. Also, 20 years ago on TV, The Practice debuted, Friends was entering its third season, it was the last season for original airings of Seinfeld, and your children were being entertained by a brand new show called The Teletubbies. In a few weeks, the news would be full of a sad tale regarding the mass suicide of a strange California cult, Heaven's Gate. Their suicide would be in conjunction with the presence of a blazing comet working in slow motion across our night skies, the hale Bop Comet. You would have, no doubt, spent cold nights out looking up at this wonderment overhead. And here is where we start the story that encompasses this episode of API Conversations. On March 13, 1997, from Henderson, Nevada, through Sonora, Mexico, and most notably over Phoenix, Arizona, unusual light formations traveled through the skies. These lights were witnessed by thousands and reported by the hundreds. My guest on API Conversations 20 years ago was entering a local public relations firestorm over an incident that came to be known worldwide as the Phoenix Lights. For the next hour, Frances Barwood, who was a city councilwoman and vice mayor for Phoenix at the time, will tell us how the phenomenon unfolded in the public eye. She will set the record straight on some mistaken assumptions and talk about the psychology of obstruction and strangeness that followed upon the heels of this now iconic UFO flap. Chances are you're familiar with the Phoenix Lights incident, and you may have read in some publications bizarre statements that are uncorroborated and sensationalized. Or, on the other spectrum, you may have read how the whole flap was easily and quickly identified as a combination of military flares and a perfect high-flying formation of airplanes. There is conflicting information in multiple publications, There is direct opposing statements from military officials. There is the sound of crickets from government officials. And there is cherry-picking of facts that maddeningly muddies the true scope of this incident. But I submit that anyone who has looked into the totality of information available on the Phoenix Lights UFO flap will conclude that something still unexplained happened and was witnessed and reported on in good faith by a multitude of persons, to include an aeronautical engineer, an astronomer, police officers, an entire stadium of Little League players and spectators, and countless individuals from every walk of life. Somewhere in the middle between an attack of little green men from Mars and much to do about nothing is where the Phoenix Light settles in for its place in history. And alongside that place in history is my guest for this API Conversations. The interview you are about to hear was recorded on April 11, 2017. Here is Frances Emma Barwood. I was on my way to the televised city council meeting of May 6th of 1997. And I was stopped by a woman named Cindy from Extra TV. Um, she just wanted to know if I knew about this object that flew over Arizona, which I did not. And what was interesting I found later is that there were some phone calls into the city council from people. They never got to the city council members. They were told not to. Uh, send it on and have 
any council member aware of whatever this was, which I thought was kind of interesting is what they were afraid of. So when I talked to this reporter, I thought something had just happened. And I said, well, when did this happen? And she said, well, it was in March and this was in May. And I'm thinking, wow, I didn't hear anything about it. So I asked, you know, exactly what happened. And she told me that apparently an object went over Arizona and uh, was seen by a lot of people and nobody would, you know, official would talk about it. Would I ask if we, if anybody would investigate? And I thought, sure, you know, and so I did. And we got into the council meeting and there's a section of the, the council, it's called a council request, and you can ask any question of any level of government on any ob any subject that there is. So my turn came, and I asked. I told him there was this reporter outside and from Extra TV, and wanted to know if uh, we would investigate this object that flew over Arizona. And everybody just kind of turned around and looked at me like just everything stopped. <laughs> and I, it was kind of embarrassing. And so I just waited for some kind of response and nothing. And somebody said, and cracked a joke and, and it went on. And normally what happens with a council request, they assign two staff members and they get back to you within a week with whatever they have found out. So nobody was assigned to me. And after the meeting was over, I asked the, the one deputy city manager, you know, why didn't anybody assign anyone to me? And he said, well, you shouldn't have asked that question. And I said, why? And he said, because nobody was supposed to talk about this. And it was, I you know, never heard of it, so I didn't know anything. And, and one of the things that had happened oh, many times in the past was if there was something that was um, a difficult issue, and we were told by the mayor not to talk about it, and I felt it was important, I would go to the news media and ask them, you know, what is this? And, and, why are we not talking about it? Because I don't work for the mayor. I work for my constituents. So it got to the point where very little was told to me because they didn't want me to go to the news media. Well, um, there had been an article in the Daily Courier the next day, March 14th, after these uh, Phoenix Lights had occurred, so there was a newspaper article, but well, yeah, but I didn't know that. I, you know, I found out after that the mayor had told everybody except me, do not talk about this and do not talk to any reporter or anybody about it. And I thought that was kind of odd. It's, you know, something flies over our airspace and and uh, you know could have done damage or. I'm thinking of high antennas and all kinds and the high buildings and and I thought, you know, that was really strange and I didn't understand why we couldn't talk about it. Well, on Friday the let's see, was it the ninth, I think it was, um, I was asked by Chris Fiscus, who is a reporter for the Arizona Republic, if he could come in and talk to me, which happened frequently on different issues. So it was like, sure, you know, whatever. What do you want to know about? Well, what he talked and <laughs> what was interesting right after that meeting, which was televised, so everybody gets to see it and they can't cut anything out of it. Um, you know, it was kind of odd around the council floor. Um, I had asked others, you know, do you know anything about this? And, and they go, not going to touch that, you know, they'd walk away. And it was like, wow seems like nobody wants to talk about it. I wonder why. And then Chris Fiscus came in and he was asking me, you know, about why, what was going on there. And I told him, 
and he said that his mother and sister saw an object, and they said that it was not from this planet. And he said, if my mother and sister said it was not from here, it was not from here. So he went on to write a really good story about what was going on at that time, including a little bit of ridicule towards me. got worse, but it was interesting. Well, that was Friday's interview, and the paper came out. Uh, Saturday morning, and I started getting phone calls at 7 a.m. And my phone number's always been in the phone book, so it, you know, I always nobody ever abused it, so I always left it in there. I started getting phone calls, and the first few phone calls I thought was, "Oh, that's interesting." You know, they saw whatever this was, and and then another, and then another. Well, the phone calls kept going on till about 11 o'clock that night, and then the next morning, same thing all day. Sunday, which was Mother's Day, it also happened to have been my late mother's birthday, and I got so many phone calls. I mean, I was hanging up on one, and the phone would ring again, and, and on and on and on. And so Monday morning, when I went into the council, uh, they had not only was my voicemail full, but people left messages on all the other council members' voicemails for me, and. Uh, they had to, by law, they have to turn over everything. So I got tons and tons of messages. And it's like, well, you know, all these people saw this thing. This is amazing. Why didn't anybody talk about it before now? And that was the one thing I had. A, um, the one thing that I had a hard time with was why did they wait two months to say anything? And why didn't they call me right away? Not knowing that some people did call, but they were told, uh, you know, oh, this is nothing or whatever. I don't know. Some people didn't remember it at all. And when they saw the article, they remembered a lot. And I thought, that was strange. So over the summer, I started calling people back. And I called back over 700 people. And everybody described the same thing. And you can't get that many people to describe the same thing. They said it was low. It was slow. It was larger than a football field. Some people said two miles wide. Uh, it was totally silent. No noise whatsoever. It had glowing lights on it. Um, there was triangular shape. And... Some people like were, were in the middle. They, had, they were having hail bop parties, and this one guy actually up in Prescott Valley here. They were having a hail bop party, and he had twenty three or twenty four people there. And he said they sensed something over them, and they all looked up and they saw this thing. And he described exactly what everybody else did. It was going south, and they watched it until it was gone, and they went back to having a hail bop party and totally forgot about it. And I'm thinking, how can you forget about something like that? But I've kind of learned how that happens. Um, it was it was just amazing to me because I realized at that point something really amazing happened. Almost everybody I talked to said that it was astounding, exciting, amazing, uh, unbelievable, um, they were awestruck. Nobody said they were terrified. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And uh, it wasn't until, and I'll skip ahead, it wasn't until the next year in November of 98. And uh, uh, it was a very cold night in Phoenix. And I was listening to Frank Baranowski, The World Around Us, which is on the radio from 10 to midnight uh, every weekend. And we were in bed and I was, and he said that uh, this lady called in and she said, did you see this, what was in the Eastern sky? And he said, no, but the guards came in, the security guards, and said he had to go outside to see this thing because it was absolutely incredible. So here we are, you know, at that point it was like 1030 and, uh, my husband said, let's go outside. So we bundled up and we went out and looked to the eastern sky. And there was this extremely bright 
cylinder tipped slightly to the the top to the left, just slightly, but it was absolutely so amazingly bright. And so I got it between the twig of the tree because we didn't have leaves on the trees. They all have fallen off. And I watched this thing. It did not move. It stayed in one spot. And so I, I called my friend in Scottsdale and I said, I said, go out on your patio deck and look to the east and tell me what you see. So she came back in and she said, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. Look at that. She said, what is that? And I said, I don't know, but I'm going to go out and look again. She goes, me too. So we went back out and we're watching this. And all of a sudden we got so extremely tired that it was almost like we were drugged. And we went in the house and went to sleep. The next Thursday, we're driving down the road and we hear the advertisement for Frank Baranowski's The World Around Us on the radio. And I turned to my husband and I said, do you remember what we saw last Saturday night? And he said, no. And I said, oh, well, maybe I dreamt it. And then I called Patty and I said, Patty, did you remember anything we saw last Saturday night? And she goes, oh, my God. Yeah. And and she remembered it. And then a little bit later, my husband remembered it. And I thought, why did I forget? Of all people, not to call the police department, not to call you know, all over and say, look to the eastern sky and see what that is. I didn't call a soul. And I did not remember it until my mind was jogged. So I thought, okay, now I understand, I think, that it's actually outside our parameters of thinking. And so either you block it out or there's some message that says you won't remember this. I don't know. But if it didn't happen to me, I guess I would have never understood that. Yeah. Well, you know, there is, obviously, there has been uh, many times told this strange kind of amnesia, and I understand it and I've experienced it, a strange amnesia that can occur associated with these sightings. But those who didn't have the amnesia and reported to you in the hundreds what they saw, how did there come to be any ambiguity as to what they were seeing, and have that mixed in with the later flares and apparently this this young kid, um, oh, Mitch Stanley, and his telescope seeing airplanes flying. How how did the ambiguity occur when there were so many of the same sighting of an object that strained credulity? Can you walk me through that? The only thing I can think of is out of you know, the over 700 people that I talked to. And each one of them, only one of them was alone, but everyone else was with other people. They all saw it. There was um, parents who were at a little league game. They all saw it. Uh, And all the players and the coaches and uh, people jogging because in Arizona in March, it's pretty good. And so there was so many people that saw it. And the one person that, said, oh, it was airplanes. That's the one who got the publicity. And I think it was a, how do, how can I put this nicely? It was the diversion on the, on the, on the government's part. I am pretty sure. Um, There was too many people and, and planes make noise and, you know, and, but they did, uh, the, the truckers that were coming South, they did say that uh, they heard the planes going after it and they did see planes that were after it like looking um but the people who did see it and then when they saw the newspaper article they the ones who didn't remember it all came back the ones who had been talking about it uh people told them they were crazy and i got two phone calls and i had caller id on my phone so i knew that it was legitimate uh, one of them was a very famous entertainer who uh, lives in the town of Paradise Valley in Phoenix. And he said he wanted to tell me because he wanted me to know what he saw was real. And it was not from here. And he said, but I can't go public with this. And, and it would be just 
uh, the end of my career. So that was one. And I told him I would never tell who it was. And I never will. Haven't even told my husband, kids, nobody. The second person uh, told me, he went on to to describe this entire thing like everybody else did. And I said, well, you know, who are you? He says, I can't tell you who I am. And I said, well, then I can't verify that you're real and, you know, and that you're telling me the truth. And he said, well, I can't risk it. He said, I'm I'm the uh, vice president of a very big company in Phoenix. And he said, I make six figures and I cannot tell my name. And I said, if I promise I will never, ever tell, I want you to tell me your name. Otherwise, don't bother me. So he did. He told me his name. And I said, thank you. And I, that was the end of that conversation. The next day, I called that company. I asked for him. And I did get him on the phone. And I said, I just wanted to verify that it was you, that it was really you. And he said, it is. Please don't ever tell. And I said, I won't. And and that's so why it two big people saw it and they had absolutely no doubt that it was an object that there's no way we had at all. Uh we had a friend who was a pilot and he did the New York to Paris flight and he said, You would not believe what we see out there and he said, We know it's not from here, but if we tell we we won't have a job anymore. And he said, after I retire, I'll write a book. He, he retired and he died. So he never wrote the book. Well, you know, you were talking about, uh, I don't like to get conspiratorial, but I, I know that the day after that incident on March 14, when this journalist Laura Hinchy wrote an article in the Daily Courier about this, she contacted the Luke Air Force Base media liaison, who happened to be uh, Sergeant Rolla Stuttmiler, and she gave an official statement and said the base did not send out any aircraft and, quote, they don't fly in the evening. But in in a later article, uh, this was what was done by Richard Price in his USA Today uh, article, June 18, that kind of broke things open. He happened to talk with with a Lieutenant Colonel Mike Hauser out there at Luke Air Force Base, and Hauser said they did happen to have some F-16s up in the air that night, but that they were, quote, on a routine training mission. And it just so happened that... Um, that in the uh, USA Today article, June 18, the the journalist had spoken with a truck driver, a cement truck driver, Bill Greiner, and he saw a couple of brilliantly lit orbs, and, and one of them flew right over Luke Air Force Base, and he stated he would take a lie detector test. The three of those F-16s took off and headed straight for that orb. So... You know, he wasn't of the mind that there was anything routine about those F-16s. They apparently made a beeline for that orb. And so there's directly contradicting um, direct quotes from officials of the Luke Air Force Base there that, you know, that really make you scratch your head. And I, it really, what else are you going to think other than some kind of concerted effort to deny what had apparently been witnessed by hundreds of people. And um, that's a hard thing for a person to put in perspective, let alone somebody like you, who happens, your purview is to get answers as an elected official for the people in your district. That must have been very frustrating for you. Well, it, it was. And I'll tell you, I met Bill Greiner and talked to him, and there's no doubt in my mind what he said. He saw, he saw. And uh, Richard uh, Curtis, who had called me, and uh, he told me that he was a disabled veteran, didn't tell me at that point where he lived, and he said uh, he was listening to the truckers coming south. He says, I've got professional CB equipment and professional video equipment, and uh, he said, I was listening to the truckers, and he said, I thought, well, I'll go up on the roof and and." you know, see what's coming and I'll film it. So he said he did. And he caught the, he had one tape in his camera and he finished that tape. 
put another one in and, and took the second tape. And he said, you can see the outline because of the reflection of the street lights. You can see that it's a, like a gunmetal gray, kind of translucent, which I thought was really interesting, and had these glowing lights on it that didn't shine down. They just kind of glowed. And he said it came right over, and he said it was low and slow and quiet, not a sound. And he said I got a really good uh, picture of it, and I said to him, oh, I said, that's great. I said, can you, can you make copies and get it to my office? And he said, sure. Well, I, you know, that was that. And that was in uh, July. It was in July. And, uh, you know, he never dropped anything off. And, and I kind of chucked it up to, well, I guess, you know, he really didn't have anything. And so I kind of just put it on the back burner. And then two weeks later, he called me up and he said, well, what did you think of the videos? And I said, well, I didn't get the videos. And he said, well, the the two men came from your office and picked them up. And I said, I don't have any men in my office. It's only women. I said, do you have copies? He said, well, they said they were going to make copies. And so I'm thinking, okay, so this is a spoof, right? And then one of the men at the village labs with uh, Jim Delatoso said he would go over and talk to him. I found out at, at that second phone call that he lived in the Westwood Ho Hotel, which was an old hotel that was converted for uh, disabled veterans and other disabled people. And so he went over there and he came back and he said, this is so incredible. He went in, and in the lobby was the manager and um, a minister who ministers to the um, people who live there. And he said he asked for Richard Curtis's room, and he asked them what they saw. And they said it was really interesting because he said, a, a car pulled up, and this was like mid-July, you know, 110 in uh, Phoenix. And the car pulled up and had dark windows, and two men got out and threw pea suits and hats, and they were thinking, well, you know, these guys are dressed like winter. And they came in and asked for Richard Curtis, and he told them, you know, what his room was, and they went up and came down and left. And they were talking about how odd this was. So anyway, it ended up where Richard Curtis, after that, and, and he talked to Richard Curtis, and he said he did have professional CB equipment and professional video equipment, and he said he's a really nice guy. And he was on television. They, they interviewed him on one of the stations about what happened that night, and he told the story of these men and everything, right? Well, after that, uh, they came and, and they said, they changed his uh, medication, and he had a really bad reaction, so they took him out, and he never came back. And nobody ever knows what happened to Richard Curtis. <laughs> so here we, we have an instance where hundreds and hundreds of people uh, purport to have seen the same thing, and told the same story over the same period of time. And now this this period of sightings, you know, was going on prior to the Phoenix area. I know a day or two before there had been mass sightings, the 10th and the 11th mass sightings over Virginia Beach, as I recall. And uh, there were also sightings before in Nevada. And so this was a true flap. It wasn't just one or two people having said they saw something. These were hundreds of people and, and scores who contacted the National UFO Reporting Center. But the odd thing is that out of 
the hundreds of sightings that are of a similar type, the one or two that are contrary to that get stitched together, and that then becomes the real narrative. And what we're left with, and what I'm questioning here and want to bring up with you, is the psychology that that you came upon. You ran into a brick wall, and I don't know if you ever were able to get a nailed-down investigation by U.S. government authorities, did you? No. <laughs> and and it's kind of interesting because uh, Chris Fiscus, when he did that interview on Friday uh, the 9th, and it appeared in, the, in Saturday paper the 10th, um, he did that on purpose because the weekday news, uh, it, the news editor would not do it. So he hit the weekend editor who put it on the front page. And right after that, he was removed from the city beat and put to the state beat. And in the city, he was one of two reporters in the state. He's like one of, you know, one fish in a barrel of hundreds. So uh, he lost his uh, importance as far as a, a writer on the city beat. And then I sent a letter to uh, uh, McCain. I, everybody that called me, I would tell, please call the governor's office and let them know what you saw. And so most of them did. And so the governor's office was inundated with phone calls and uh, didn't hear anything back. And McCain, uh, Senator McCain was on television saying, you know, oh, he would look into this. And, you know, I thought, oh, that's good. I'll send him a letter. So we did a letter and, and went to his office and uh, nothing. And I found out that it, he actually forwarded to Lansford Trapp, the uh, director of armed services. I didn't even know there was a director of armed services. And but nothing, nothing back. And so I sent another letter and I said, you know, I, I want to know what you're going to be doing about this and nothing. And so my office called his office to find out what happened and why he hasn't responded. And they said, well, he, that letter was sent to the National Archives. Well, the National Archives are kind of called the, the big trash can in the sky because all they do is file stuff and they don't investigate, they don't do anything. And so my my assistant called the National Archives and she talked to this lady and the lady said, No, we don't respond, we just file. And she said, Well can you can you send me a letter that said you received this letter from Senator McCain's office? And she said, Well we don't send out any letters and she said so my my assistant said, Well can you fax me uh, just a note saying that, you know, you got this letter from uh, that I sent and that they sent to the National Archives. And so they she did do that. And so I thought, well, here's McCain who said he would investigate and he doesn't want to touch it. And of course, then the governor was uh, at a child health meeting in uh, June and he he also was in court because of he had bucked the federal government and when they said they were closing down the Grand Canyon because they didn't have enough money, he said, I'm not going to allow the Grand Canyon to be closed down because there's too many businesses that depend on it. So I'm sending the National Guard. Well, then the next thing that happened, he was doing a project down in Phoenix, the Esplanade, and the federal government came down on him, mind you, a governor, the federal government comes down on him and says, you uh, filed fraudulent papers. You fudged your value on some buildings. And and so they took him to court. And when that happened, which was prior, I said to my husband, that's because he bucked the federal government. So they came down on him. And uh, you know, just to set an example, you don't go against when the federal government said they're going to do something. You don't go against that. Well, then here he comes out with this uh, thing on his lunch break. And one reporter said, what are you going to do about investigating the, the Phoenix Lights? And in all seriousness, he said, I'm going to look into it and we're going to investigate. 
Well, then he, that was his lunch break from the trial that he was in. He went back to court. The people who were in court watching this uh, trial said he was taken into the judge's chambers and did not come out again. And the next thing on, on the news, it said that the governor was holding an emergency press conference at 5 p.m. I didn't relate the two. I thought the emergency press conference was going to be an emergency. Something happened. Well, he comes out and, you know, you you saw, like everybody else saw, the the taping of that. And he came out and said they, they looked into it. And then, um, oh, God, I can't remember his assistant's name, Chuck Conley, I think it was, uh, comes out dressed as an extraterrestrial. And they made a big joke of it. And so I said to my husband, I bet they're going to drop all charges. I bet they said to him, you better make a joke of this or you're going to go to jail. And he knew that they would do that. And he had six kids, you know, wife and six kids at home. And we've known Ann and Fife for years, and they're really nice people. He does not have a sense of humor. So there was no way in the world that he cooked that up. And he has never talked to me since then. I, I saw him at an event, and I went over. I said, hi, Ann, where's your husband? She goes, over there. I went to walk over to him and he just backed off and went into another room. And I thought, okay, he doesn't want to talk to me and I can understand. Well, the next thing is, is, uh, he's, he's left office. And, uh, then the next thing he talks about that he did see this object and he never did say why he did that, um, kind of weird press conference. But uh, in my theory, it was, you know, do you want to go home to your wife and six kids or do you want to go to jail? And, uh, you know, they can do whatever they want. You know, though, he had the chance to set the record straight in Leslie Kane's book, uh, UFOs on the Record. And um, he did not choose to to uh, drop a dime on the government if that was the case. He had the opportunity. And, you know, I... I read the book there and um, read his his chapter in that, I think it was like chapter 24, that, that he answered, Five Symington answered, uh, when he should have been um, straightforward with his public, and he wasn't. Um, yeah. There's been yeah. several times the guy has had the opportunity to do the right thing, and now I don't even believe him honestly when he when he writes and tells that he saw that object because he wasn't with anybody else when he supposedly saw that object, and he does not enjoy my um, um, benefit of the doubt. I'm sorry to say because he's dropped the ball when he really should have been stalwart, and I know he's a friend of yours, and I understand. And he must have been under, you know, considerable constraints because he was a politician. But, you know, that was then. This is now. It's 20 years later. And I I don't know what to think of him, honestly. I don't trust the man. I don't believe him. And I still have a bad taste in my mouth for that ridiculous ruse he pulled that made a mockery of hundreds of people's honest, straightforward accounting oh, yeah. of what occurred. And there was an off that the second that press conference was over, my phone started ringing. People were furious. And, and I was, too. I was really very disappointed. But I'll tell you, he was in the position at that time that he was in court. And they could have put him away in prison without a blink of the eye. So I don't I, I do believe that he saw something. And when he was in the Air Force, he was a, I forget what they called, but like a spotter that identified planes. So he, you know, he had that talent to be able to see if it was something from here or not. Um, I, you know, if you're, if you're threatened with, you have absolutely no recourse and you can either, you know, be put in prison for a stupid, you know, a charge that was ludicrous, but it was from the federal government, or going home. I would choose going home and let 
you know, the time went by and he ended up telling what he saw. Uh, he, we've never talked since then. I mean, never, <laughs> it was, it, you know, I, I wish that he would, I, I would love to talk to him because I really do think that's what happened. I think he was given that choice and he had to have that stupid press conference that was, that made so many people angry and including me. I mean, I can't believe he did that. Well, you know, reading between the lines in um, Leslie Kane's book, uh, it kind of sounds like Five Symington is doing a mea culpa for having left you hung out to dry on that. I I don't think so. I I think um, I think that what he did, he had to do because of the issue at the time, and and they did go after him because of what he did, and you know he was not going to let the Grand Canyon be closed down. And the federal government was very angry. So they had to have something that they could get him on. And what they got him on was when he listed his properties as collateral on his financial statement, um, they said he, he overestimated their value. That's what they got him on. And it was it was ridiculous because he didn't overvalue anything, but they said he did. And if the federal government says you did, that's it. That's all they could get him on. You know, how how can we possibly get to a guy who's pretty squeaky clean? And, you know, he's he was a, a good, good guy. And that's how they got him. And that's that's my opinion, because it it adds up. And, and I don't ever expect him to say that it was a deal to be able to uh, get out of going to prison. You know, you put the two and two together and it sure, sure seems like it. And I don't blame him at all. Well, you know, as I was saying in the book now, here's a quote from that book that I think is telling. It says, in the months following the event, Symington had observed the press making fun of his friend Francis Barwood for simply taking the sighting seriously in response to public pressure. And she wasn't even a witness. He was also dealing with his share of political battles within the vicious world of Arizona politics, which you allude to. And he says, quote, can you imagine what would have happened if I had said anything? And he seems like he felt bad that that he did not stand up, and you did. You took the brunt of it. Now, in retrospect, Francis Barwood, if you could do it over again, would you do anything differently? No. Um, <laughs> my my dad was the chief investigator for the city of New York, and uh, under Mayor Wagner. And there were times that he had investigated things that were pretty scary. And there were times that we were told, do not go by the windows until my investigation on what I'm doing now is over. There was a lot of repercussions in that. But my dad always said he would never quit until he found the answer. And looking back, I wish I would have done more. I I was so busy with other council stuff, that it was uh, difficult for me to realize that, you know, like Senator McCain didn't want to touch it, and uh, the governor couldn't touch it, and uh, the other officials, I mean, my fellow council members, the, the mayor put a, and his, and his assistant uh, were handing out business cards when they went to meetings, and it was Frances Emma Barr would speak into the tin foil and she will hear you. And and I didn't know that until I got one in an inter-office envelope from someone in his office saying, you need to know what the mayor's doing. And they put uh, signs on my, everybody's picture was, you know, in the hall so that for all the council members. And they put a sign on mine and it said, Frances Emma Barr would from the planet Xenon. And, you know, I, I was not prepared for all of that. Looking back, I, I don't know how you prepare for something like that, but looking back, I, I think I would have been a little more forceful as to, I went to a meeting at the um, armory down in Phoenix where the National Guard was, 
And in the, we were talking out in the lobby at the intermission of the meeting. And this one, uh, I had an, I, she was a female. She came, I know her name. She came over to me and she just kind of bumped into me and she said, I want you to know it's real. We can't talk about it. And she walked away. And and it was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, so um, I think there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than we possibly know. There's definitely something else going on out there. And uh, there was just an article in the Prescott Daily Courier up here that in the 1800s up here, there was a um, craft that came and they saw it and they and the whole article was like, wow, nobody ever told me about this. And this was in the 1800s and there was not even planes or anything. So, you know, you look at all that and throughout history, there's stories of, you know, they've seen things in the skies and of course there was no planes, jets or whatever. And we look at our technology and we think it's the do all end all. Well, I grew up with a dial phone and a 10 party line and uh, black and white television, and look where we are now. Who would have ever thought? And so, you know, in a sh- in my lifetime, <laughs> which has gone by really fast, but you know, you think about that, and you know, it, it's we can't even imagine what is out there, but, or what we could even us accomplish. And you know, our technology, they keep. You know, it keeps changing now so rapidly. Well, what if there's something so far advanced that we not even in the horizon for us? So we we don't know. But you know, again, if we are being visited, obviously they're much more advanced than we are. And so I think yes, there's other planets. Uh, there there's other intelligent life. Is obviously more intelligent than we are, and you know if we're the best there is, that's scarier yet. So obviously they have technology that is probably much more advanced than us, since they they if they have a way of getting here and and are so far advanced, if they wanted to hurt us, they would have. I think they're observing us, and you know I don't know what. But their theory is, other than, oh, my God, they're still so uncivilized and they're not ready for us or whatever. Or maybe they're getting us ready for a visit. I don't know. Yeah. So you are definitely in the extraterrestrial hypothesis camp. You suspect they're probably some type of being that is not from the Earth. So along that lines, the people that you have had occasion to talk with since the last 20 years that this happened, did you ever get anybody who, um, other than that woman that uh, said to you under her breath, it's real, have you had any others talk to you about what could be going on that they have knowledge of? No. And I I think, well, you know, you, you look at my friend Russ, who was the pilot, and uh, he worked for Braniff, and, you know, he said there's no doubt in his mind, but he can never talk about it until he's retired, and he retired and died. So he, you know, he was going to write a book of all the things he saw, and he said all the pilots know that there's things from other planets not here. And, you know, if you you just take that, and you know that they're not the only ones, there's got to be You know, people in NASA, there's got to be people in other levels of government. You look at uh, Carter. Carter said he was, once he was in office, he was going to go in and, you know, what happened with that? And, you know, he was, he would never talk about it again. And so you look at all that and you think, what are they afraid of? And the only thing I can think of is they're afraid of losing power. Yeah. And it's sad because, I mean, right now we've got oh, so much evil in the world and it's so scary and so awful. And, you know, you, you just wonder what's what's going to happen just with humans. <laughs> and and again, you know, if we are being visited by more intelligent life, which if we are being visited, they are more intelligent. Um, what do they think of us? You know, are, are we ready 
And I think, you know, the best thing that they could possibly do is land in a, when they have one of these really big, and I'm not a sports person, but like really big football, you know, extravaganzas and uh, they could land in the middle of the football field and, and, you know, tell people, Hey, we're here and we're, you know, uh, we've got all this wonderful technology and all these cures and all, you know, on and on and on. Um, I also think they, they probably look pretty much like us. So I don't think it's going to be anything frightening. And um, I don't know. I just hope I'm still alive. I, I keep joking that I'm going to be 93 years old. It's going to be the 40th anniversary, and I'm going to be introduced by an extraterrestrial at the at the 40th anniversary event. So I don't know, <laughs> but we'll see. So you haven't had, other than that one sighting you had that you called your friend up, you haven't had any other type of anomalous experiences? Well, <laughs> it's kind of interesting because I moved from Vermont to uh, Arizona in 1980. And my middle boy and I went out to get the mail at the mailbox. And uh, and it's kind of funny because I didn't even think about that all this time. Um, we went out there and, and uh, I looked up and I said to him, what's that? And he looked up and he said, I don't know. And it was a square thing. Um, it, it was with a hole in the middle flying overhead. And I said, it looks like a flying house. And he said, yeah, it does. And we went in the house and that was it. I just, there was one of, on a video that was shown at the 20th anniversary down that Dr. Lynn had. And one of the things shown was exactly what we saw. And so I called my son up and I, he happens to be a Phoenix EMT on firemen, firefighters. And uh, I called him up and I said, Chuck, do you remember back, you know, we first moved to Phoenix and we went out to get the mail and we saw something. Well, he then remembered and he goes, yeah, and he described it all the same. And, and it was like, that's so weird. I mean, for, I don't I didn't talk about it at all in 1980. Didn't even think of it being a UFO or anything. And it was just really odd. How high up was it, and how big do you think it was? It wasn't that high up, and it was probably, I'd say, on on each side of this square thing was probably a city block long. It was just different. <laughs> it was about the size of a city block flying above you? Yeah. And now, when you say it wasn't that high up, what are you talking? It was low, like a, a helicopter, a helicopter flying when they're taking traffic yeah. assessment? Yeah, about that. This was low, and it was in the daytime. It was, you know, middle of the day. It didn't make any noise, and it just slowly went over us. And I'll tell you, my mind, when she was showing that video, and one of the things that they captured on video was what I saw, and that's when I called, when we got home, I called my son and asked him. And he remembered he was uh, 10 at the time. We never even talked about it after that. You know, it was, we walked in the house and, and I never said to him, what was that? We saw nothing, nothing, zero. <laughs> and it was like, that was really strange. Isn't that an odd aspect of that phenomenon? It happens over and over and over. Yeah. What do you think that is about? Uh, again, the only thing I can think of is that it's outside of your acceptable barriers. It, it, so it's something, you know, it's like I had a really bad car accident. I do not remember the accident at all. Yeah, I read about that accident, as a matter of fact. I read your words on that. You had a rather otherworldly experience from that, yes? Yes, I had a dream the night before that my husband left home without his without all his tools for a job site. And and in my dream, I was driving, bringing it, and I saw a really bad accident. And so in the morning, I said to him, make sure you take all your tools. Do not forget anything. I told him about the dream. And I said, don't forget anything. He said, okay. So he got everything, took off. And about, oh, 10 minutes to 8. He called and he said he left two boxes by the trailer wheel that he needed. And could I bring it to him? And I said, oh, Lordy. So I said, I told you, you know, don't forget anything. He goes, I know, but we stuck it by the wheel and then I forgot. So I put it in the car and I and I set off and um, 
is this was up here in northern Arizona. And he said he'd send a guy down to the other end of the outer loop. So I got on and I'm, you know, watching carefully everything. And there was uh, uh, traffic people out there with flashing lights. And I thought, oh, my goodness, the accident that I must have, you know, that was in my dream. And I get up to it and it wasn't. They were building a bridge. And so they were stopping traffic to let the trucks go by with the, uh, you know, whatever it was in it and coming back and forth with they what they were building with. And uh, so then they let everybody through and I'm going along. And I get to the other end of the outer loop and I give the guy, met him at the uh, gas station, gave the guy the two boxes. And I said, well, I'm not going to go back that way because of the traffic due to the construction. I think I'll just go down Willow Creek Road. And he goes, oh, they got construction down there, too. And I said, well, then maybe I'll just go halfway back and I'll go down 89. I did my little turnaround. I go back the other way. And as I'm driving along, there's hardly any traffic because they had stopped everybody with the construction. And uh, so I'm driving along and I see this little animal going. It was either a squirrel or a cat that went from my side of the road to the other side of the road. That's the last I remember. And I wake up and I have um, a guy, a bald-headed guy with his face in my face saying, do you know who you are? And I said, yeah. And he goes, what's your name? And I told him my name. He goes, you know the date? And I said, September 28th. So I said, what happened? And I looked past him and my windshield is completely shattered. And I said, did my car explode? And he didn't say anything. And then I look on my right side, and there's uh, an EMT uh, putting a needle in my arm. And I said, did my car explode? And she didn't say anything. And she said, I want you to tell me if you can feel anything. And I said, well, I didn't feel the needle. That was good. And so she's poking me on my arms and my legs. And I said, no, I don't feel anything. And so she said, we're going to cover you with a heavy material, which was a canvas. And she said, it's going to get really loud because we have to cut you out. And I was calm as a cucumber. And he said, okay. And so they covered me and, and it's like really loud noise. And they cut my car and, you know, to get me out. And so they took me out of the car. And the only pain I had was when they put the neck brace on and I screamed. The pain was unbelievable into my head. And they put me on the stretcher and I said, where are we going? And they said, in the helicopter. Well, everybody who knows me knows I do not fly. It's, you know, if I, if I was supposed to fly, I would have wings. And I was calm. And I said, okay. And they put me in the helicopter and the, the sheriff guy who was the bald headed guy, after he put his head in to talk to me, he said, broken neck, broken ribs, and broken knees. And I'm thinking, wow, somebody got hurt. And so anyway, I'm in the helicopter. And uh, next thing, I'm not in a helicopter. And I am in an amazing place. And I, I can't even describe the color because it's nothing that we have at all. But it was absolutely incredible. And I knew I was dying. And I knew if I stepped forward, I would be dead. And I said, I said, God, my family's not ready for this. But if you send me back, can you send me back healed? And I don't know why I prayed that. Next thing, I am back in the helicopter with all the noise and everything, and they're landing in Phoenix. And it was like a second from when they put me in to landing. Then they, they wheeled me in. They, did, they put me in this uh, machine, and, and they put me in a room. And I look and I see my son as all his gear. And I said, Chuck, what are you doing here? And he goes, I came to see you. And I said, is this serious? And he goes, yeah. Then the doctor came in and he said, I'm going to look at the scope again, the, the scan again. And he said, I'll be back. And then he came back in and he said, you don't have a broken bone in your body. You can go home. So they put me in a wheelchair and my husband came. So they put me in the truck and and took me home. And they said, you know, see your doctor in, you know, a day or two. Well, I had an appointment the next day with my doctor anyway. 
for my allergies. <laughs> so I went in to the doctor's and I, and I was uh, sore. I had bruises, uh, had my seatbelt on, and uh, it was bruised all across my seatbelt. And uh, the doctor said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I had the appointment and they told me to see you, so I figured I'd come in. And he looked at me, and this is not an emotional doctor. He took my two hands and he said, I read the report. You've been given a second life. Use it well. And it was like, wow, it it wasn't a dream. It was real. <laughs> and so then we went to the wrecking yard where my car was to get all my personal stuff out. And my husband and the guy, um, you know, found the car. And the guy at the wrecking yard said, whoever was in this car is dead. And I said, no, it, it was me. And he goes, you're kidding. Years before that, like three, four years, I was given this coin and it said, uh, God is great. Jesus is Lord. And I lost it. And it was on my dashboard. And the, the guy found it. And he said, well, this is something, you know, this was right on the dashboard and all this mess. So he hands it to me. And I said, I lost this three or four years ago. Well, he freaked out <laughs> and, and it was like, okay, so there's more to life than, you know, just the living and dying There's there's a whole lot more and there's more to our universe than just us. And so I have a whole different perspective. Oh, I would see why that was a profound experience. Yeah. You know, again, we, we live in. Uh, our own little parameters, and I think when it goes outside what we understand, we can just block that out. Yeah, we clearly don't know a whole lot about what's going on in our reality, and we're reminded of that when we have anomalous experiences. These are things that actually happen that cannot be accounted for in our known physics. And so um, mm -hmm. it causes the human mind a lot of vexation. Uh, but then there are these transcendent moments that change kind of how we see the world from that point on. And, and I guess that is the point of experiences, to change some of us bit by bit, uh, to not be who we were anymore, to be a newer creature, a better creature, a more advanced creature. Maybe that's the gift of those things. Yeah. Francis Barwood still lives in the Phoenix area. And this year, 2017, marks the 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. It is still being hotly debated, yet it's become iconic, indelibly etched in the minds of those who experienced it firsthand. Mass sightings over a period of days or weeks is a whole different animal than disparate here and there reports of odd aerial goings on. The scope and scale of mass sightings and the attendant high strangeness that sometimes accompanies UFO sightings is a type of anomalous experience for the human psyche that, as futurist and ufologist Richard Thiem says, is a brick through the window something that challenges us at a fundamental level. There is no way of proving what is going on. But to hold to a firm belief that nothing is going on, I would submit, belongs to the realm of the willfully ignorant. You have been listening to API Conversations, Episode 5. I'm Marsha Barnhart, and my guest was Francis Barwood. API Conversations is a spin-off of API Case Files. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. 
The spoken content of API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 4.0 license, as is the music heard during this program by DJ Spooky and Broke for Free. Links to information on this Episode 5 of API Conversations is included in the show notes. Be sure to check out our other API Conversations podcasts as well as API Case Files at www.apicasefiles.com. This is API Case Files, Case Files, Case Files.